Hey guys, this is my story. Um, I remember uh, vividly, it was about four years ago, I was standing in the kitchen, uh, standing in front of the sink, or talking to my wife who was sitting on the couch at the time, um, and we were having a conversation. And um, I remember very specifically that she knew something was very heavy and something was going on, but she didn't know what. And um, I knew I wanted to tell her, I needed to tell her, but I didn't know how. Um, so. In so many words, I just gave her some clues and she was able to guess um, that something had happened to me. And through a series of further questions, it came out that I was uh, sexually abused as a kid. And this is when I was 33 years old. Uh, and that is when I told anybody uh, for the first time. And as you can imagine, as a 33 year old that's been living with this for well over 20 years, um, there was a flood of feelings and emotions and guilt and shame and um, I just, I couldn't even keep it together. I just broke down crying right there at the sink and she came over and she just held me and um, that was about all we got through that night, but that was the start of my journey. And um, I'm making this video I'm far from being on the other side of it, but I am um, definitely in a significantly better place. I've been through years and years of therapy uh, counseling, um, been on antidepressants, uh, anti-anxiety medicine, uh, spent hours and hours and hours in therapy chairs and, um, you know, here I am coming out the other side of it far from, far from being over, but, um, definitely on the road to recovery. Uh, this is something that I lived with for 20 plus years and something that I've been on, um, the other side of since the first time I said it for only about four years. So you can imagine that um, it's going to be a process and it's not something that's going to happen overnight, but I just want to get it out there that, um, you know, with the statistics, um, I sadly became a statistic when I was 10 years old. And that statistic is that one in six guys and one in four or maybe even one in three women uh, are sexually abused. And um, for me, that happened when I was about 10 years old. Now, I grew up in a very loving home, uh, by all accounts, very strict, very rigid uh, Christian home, ultra conservative, if I had to put a definition to it, but um, a very loving home nonetheless. My parents really did what they thought was best. And um, unfortunately, that uh, may have been a little bit misguided but nonetheless out of no ill will or malice so i remember when i was um, about 10 years old one of my uh, friends that lived in the neighborhood is an older guy that um, i was allowed to play with he was um kind of looked up to him because he's a little bit older he went to a you know a private school which i thought was super cool and um you know he had access to things that i didn't have like you know he can get into a playboy and he had a bb gun just little things like that you know as a 10 year old kid that's pretty cool um, so I just remember, um, wasn't one specific instance, wasn't anything that happened all at once. It's a process that I now know is called grooming. Um, so it started off with little things. Um, you know, I remember the first time I did anything that um, I regretted with him was um, just looking at porn. So we had a Playboy and, uh, you know, that was my first exposure to pornography of any kind was at 10 years old. And um, I just remember sitting in the remember sitting in the garage uh, behind a stack of boxes and he pulled out the Playboy and, um, you know, just giggling, and laughing, and thought it was great and looked at boobs for the first time. So um, that's kind of what started the slippery slope that ended up leading to me being abused. Um, started with the Playboy and subsequent things were um, did everything from shoplifting at the worst, uh, you know, try to stole one of his dad's beers and tried that, thought it was disgusting and had no idea why anybody would drink that. Um, ended up smoking cigarettes, cigars, um, you know, just a series of bad uh, choices that I was led down by this particular perpetrator of mine. And it wasn't all at once. This whole process from start to finish took probably about eight or nine months where I'd do one little thing um, and every little thing that I did gave him a little bit more control. So start off with the pornography. Um, that's something that um, I really enjoyed at that age. Uh, obviously, it's something that was very awful and I should never have been exposed to. But at the same time, it's something that I kept coming back for. So that gave him a modicum of control over me. Um, 
subsequent things like uh, stealing a stealing a beer. Uh, you know, if that came out that I had tried a beer, then I would have gotten in major major trouble at my house. Uh, you know, same thing with smoking a cigarette. I just want to be one of the cool kids, you know, like smoking a cigarette and being all rebellious. Uh, but again, if my parents find out, then they would um, quite literally lose their shit. So um, that's not something that I could tell them. And so now we had pornography. We had drinking a beer. We had smoking a cigarette. Um, at one point, I took a dare and attempted to shoplift. And I say attempted because I never actually made it out of the store. Um, my naive self thought I could jump on uh, my bike and ride away. And of course, it had those little alarm thingies. So when you're... Uh, at the store, you walk out the door, you see those like metal um, sensors. Yeah, I set those off and had half the store coming after me. So uh, needless to say, I never made it to my bike or anywhere else. And that was enough to scare me straight in the shoplifting department. I never did that again. Uh, but obviously, I never told anybody. And my parents never knew. So again, that gave him another lever that he could control me with. And um, that went on for... Uh, like I said, about eight months. And then the culmination of that was I was actually abused. Um, I was raped. Let's call it what it is. Um, I was raped for um, a period of about three months. Um, and that included everything from, um, you know, him forcing me to help him masturbate um, to eventually actually uh, being raped. Um, I remember very specifically, um, it happened one of two places in his clubhouse in his backyard. He had this cool little, um, well, I thought it was cool at the time uh, until what happened. But he had a, um, like a treehouse fort kind of thing in his backyard. And um, he would look at porn while he made me masturbate him. And, um, you know, that again, not the final straw, but definitely something that gave him control. And if I was willing to do that, then you know, obviously I got uh, fully raped at the end and that was um, something that, um, you know, with everything else that had happened, there was no way I could go and tell my parents that, oh yeah, now I had done all these things, plus this happened and this happened. Um, so for one, I felt more like an accomplice or a participant in it because I had more or less gone along with everything else up to that point because each one took me a little further and gave him more control over me, so I didn't feel like I could say no. Um, but ultimately, it was something that I had no ability to tell my parents, and um, quite frankly, I don't think was ever even on their radar in any way, shape, or form. Um, so that led to a very uh, disruptive childhood, as you can imagine, having that happen at 10, I was probably 11 when it all ended. Um, never telling anybody about it, nobody ever knowing about it, and having to live with that and carry that for uh, the next 22 years. As you can imagine, that was not something that um, I had the capacity to deal with, um, I wanted to deal with, you know, I was quite literally just trying to survive. And I remember um, very vividly that I would act out in these crazy ways at home. Um, you know, very angry, very rebellious, very just pissed off um, at my parents, at life, at, you know, just everything because I was hurting and I was wounded and I didn't know what to do. So my cries for help were um, perceived as <clears throat> They were perceived as anger and um, hatred and uh, rebelliousness. And basically the end result was that I was punished. Um, it got so bad at one point that I was actually kicked out of my room um, and had to move into a cot where I had three shelves as punishment. Um, it escalated further to one point when I was around 16 where I actually got kicked out of the house or technically, I guess I left of my own accord because they gave me an ultimatum and I figured I could just do it on my own. Uh, so I lasted a whole night or maybe two, I don't even remember, but then I was back at home and uh, decided that I would just kind of suck it up and uh, get through the next you know, couple of years till I left the house. So fast forward to getting out of high school, um, what that looked like me was I never dealt with it. I, all I could do, my coping mechanism or my survival mechanism was to push it down. 
uh, just kind of suppress it and didn't know how to deal with it, didn't know how to cope with it any other way. So I started turning to alcohol, uh, pretty heavily drinking from probably the age of about 19. Um, very functional, kept moving forward in my uh, jobs, kept stable income, um, all those things. But um, I was very hurt and very wounded and very broken inside. And that led to me drinking pretty, uh, pretty regularly um, and drinking large amounts basically to just numb the pain. Um, my attempts at connection were just sleeping around. Um, I had no capacity for any kind of a real relationship. So uh, to get any kind of connection, all I would do is just, you know, pick up random girls at the club and um, I would end up sleeping with them uh, sometimes for extended periods. But anytime it got even remotely serious, then that's when I would break it off and uh, I'd move on to the next thing. And um, that was kind of my pattern for years and years and years until um, I met my wife, Jamie. And um, when we got married, this was something, this whole uh, abuse, everything that had happened was something that had been suppressed for so long. It wasn't even something that was conscious. Um, it was just something buried deep, deep down inside and something that I had gotten to the point after living with it for 20 years um, <clears throat> or almost 20 years at that time when we met that um, it was basically just, it was stuffed so deep down inside and I'd kind of locked it in a box that it wasn't something that I was even conscious of on a conscious level, like subconsciously. Um, I knew something was very wrong inside, but at the same time, I had no desire to figure out what that was. And I had no desire to try to deal with it because all my experiences in childhood had taught me that, you know, anything that I bring up or anything that I try to do is just going to lead to me being punished. Um, so after we had been married a couple of years, my wife um, got into a uh, private practice or started working um, with the nonprofit ministry in more of a private practice capacity. And specifically that ministry dealt um, specifically with trafficked women. So women that had been um, trafficked for the purpose of sex. And seeing um, those women being exposed to that, hearing their stories, um, it started to caused me to have panic attacks to the point where I was um, quite literally on several different occasions. I had no idea what was going on, but I felt like I was having a heart attack. Um, and I actually went into the hospital and went into the ER with chest pain because I felt like I was going to die quite literally. And um, it wasn't until years and years later that I can um, now say that that was almost certainly a panic attack. Um, but at the time I had no clue what it was. I had no idea what was going on. All I knew is that I would get rapid breathing. I'd get dizzy. There would be times where I'd be in my car driving and I'd have a panic attack and I would literally have to pull over the side of the road because I couldn't even see straight. And, um, you know, this went on for, for a fair period of time. And there was another dear friend in our uh, life that, um, had been through a similar and since by all accounts, much worse than what I went through, but she was several um, years in front of me in the process of healing. And just hearing her story, uh, being around her, uh, being exposed to that in conjunction with the, the whole nonprofit side where I was dealing with the human trafficking aspect of things, even though I wasn't directly involved, so my wife was doing the counseling, I did volunteer and help out where I could. Um, that again furthered these panic attacks, this anxiety, like the major depression, um, all those kinds of symptoms to where many days I couldn't even get out of bed. Um, and these panic attacks were becoming more regular and more regular. And eventually that led to that night in the kitchen where I was standing um, at the sink in our kitchen. Uh, the kids had just gone to sleep and I'm for the first time in over 20 years, uh, telling my wife that I was sexually abused as a child. And for me that, um, I can't even tell you the feelings that that brought out. It brought out so much, um, like a flood of emotions to the point where I was just literally in bed, um, crying, curled up in a ball, quite literally in the fetal position, just crying. Uh, my wife couldn't do anything. All she could really do was just hold me. And um, that's kind of what started my journey towards healing. 
And my first um, steps were to contact our church because they did have some people I dealt with counseling and they were very intent on keeping everything inside the church. So I went to, uh, and actually truthfully, it wasn't even me that went to it. I couldn't even have that conversation. So Jamie had to go to the appropriate people there and um, just let them know that there was a conversation that was had last night and um, this is what's come out. And as a result of that, I entered into counseling with one of the pastors at our church. And um, to be completely blunt and honest, and again, nothing that they did was intended to harm, but it set me back further than it helped me because they were just not equipped to handle uh, what I was going through, especially being that fresh and that, you know, recently, um, having been that recently revealed, um, it was just, it, quite frankly, it was a disaster. So after about four or five months of that, I ended up going to a different counselor, um, a professional counselor that had a PhD, uh, again, Christian counselor, because I had been conditioned that mental health was bad um, as a kid and that anything um, dealing with mental health, you just needed to pray more and read your Bible and then, then God would take it away. Um, so having that mentality, I felt like I had to go to a Christian counselor because a secular quote unquote secular counselor, uh, was not an option. Um, that was, that was kind of my mindset on it. So I went to a Christian counselor by all accounts, a very, uh, knowledgeable, very equipped person, um, in most areas, but had no experience or no real knowledge of childhood sexual abuse. And as a result, what we ended up doing over the next, um, took almost a year before I left that counselor, um, was just dealing with all the peripheral issues. Um, my marriage, my work, my depression, um, you know, anything but the actual core issue of having been abused as a kid and still having no clue how to process or deal with that. Um, and for me, that led to so much hope and despair because I was sitting here with this person that's supposed to be a professional and all I want to do is is deal with this and get past it and get on with life and they're doing everything but help me do that. Um, all I'm getting is, okay, well, let's focus on your work this week and how it's impacting your work and then your marriage and how it's impacting your marriage and um, you know, how's your sleep? How's the anxiety? How's the depression? Like all the circumstantial stuff that had nothing to do with it is what was being dealt with. And that left me quite frankly, just hopeless because I thought if this professional can't help me and they're not going to confront the problem head on, then what the heck am I supposed to do? Like, I'm going to live with this forever and I should have never freaking brought it up. And I remember very specifically at after I left that last counselor, I remember walking into church um, one day and I, I was very hopeless at that point and I had no, um, I had more or less decided to give up. I, I was just done. I'm not gonna continue in counseling, there's no point. Um, but I walked in to church and I remember the first time I walked in after that, um, it felt like I was dripping with this shame and this guilt. And it was almost like the best way I can describe it is like everybody in the church knew. I felt like everybody saw right through me. I felt like walking in the door, I had this giant tattoo. I was abused um, across my forehead. And it was just the most horrific and gut-wrenching and um, sickening feeling um, that I had and to this day, like I can remember it very vividly and it's nothing that anybody did. It's just, that was the weight of what I was carrying all this time and unable to deal with it. I hit kind of a breaking point there. Um, and praise God, that's not where the story ends. But um, after a brief period of not going to any counseling and just trying to survive, I ended up getting um, a recommendation to a uh, psychologist that specializes in childhood sexual abuse with men. And um, this whole time, I mean, I was well over two years into, um, into it at this point, and I had not met a single other person um, that had experienced this, or not a single other male, I should say, that had experienced this. 
Um, I had no knowledge of anybody, even second or third hand. And I felt very much like I was on an island. And that's my biggest purpose in making this video is that I want you to know that you're not alone. Um, wherever you're at in the process, wherever you're going through, like you're not alone. And statistically, there are so many guys out there that um, have gone through this at some age and who are probably not going to deal with it or haven't dealt with it at all because there's such a stigma attached to mental health in men. And especially something like this, like I'm 6'8", I'm a big guy, uh, weigh 265 pounds, like I'm the epitome of kind of a man, you know, nobody's going to look at me and say, oh yeah, he was abused when he was a kid. No, like the complete opposite. But that's the whole thing is that like, it can happen to anybody. I was raised in a very strict, very rigid Christian home, uh, homeschooled the whole nine yards by all accounts. It should have been an extremely safe environment from anything like that happening, yet it did. And that's my purpose or my ultimate purpose in this is that there is hope and you can get out of it. Like I'm you know, from the time that I first expressed it till now, four years on the other side of it, after living 22 years with it, like I'm by all accounts, a hundred percent better than I was, but far from where I want to be. And it's a process and it's a growth and it's something that I'm going to have to continue working on. And this is kind of my way of punching fear in the face and just, you know, yes, I was a statistic. Yes, I was abused as a kid, but I want to use that story for good and I want to help other people that may be in the same situation and let them know that you're not alone. I That was my biggest feeling, guilt, shame, and just like I was completely alone. Um, and you're not alone and I'm not condemning church counseling by any means. I'm sure there's some very well-equipped churches out there that have this under control, but my experience has been that church counseling is not the way to go when you're dealing with sexual abuse. There's just, they're not equipped for it. And it is such a um, detrimental thing that happens. Like I learned after I got to a psychologist that actually dealt with this stuff specifically that at the age it happens. So for me around 10 or 11 years old, um, that's where my frontal lobe or I'm assuming frontal lobe, I believe that's correct. Uh, but one of my lobes basically stopped developing. So it was essentially frozen for the next, you know, up until basically I started going through therapy that dealt specifically with the trauma, you know, 20 years later, it was basically frozen in the state of a 10 year old brain. So it ceased to develop, it just got frozen in time. And I went through my whole life with that as part of my brain, basically a 10 year old brain. And that had, I'll never know the full consequences of that, but you can imagine that, you know, being a 30 year old guy with a 10 year old frontal lobe is not a good thing. So um, I think I'm starting to ramble here, so I'm going to wrap it up. But um, that's just kind of that's my story um, in a nutshell. Like, by God's grace, I'm out the other side of it. I have a loving wife. I have three wonderful kids. Um, I have a business. I'm on the verge of, um, you know, getting a. <clears throat> I'm in the process of getting my coaching practice going. And this video, like I said, was about me punching fear in the face because it's something that I know statistically, um, there's many, many, probably hundreds and thousands or sadly, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of people out there that have dealt with this. And you're not alone, but I also want you to understand that if you're going to get help, make sure it's somebody that knows what they're doing. Make sure it's somebody that specializes in uh, sexual abuse because there are so many counselors out there and my wife will be the first one to tell you that unless you're equipped in it, then it's not something that you should be handling. My wife's a professional counselor. She's a licensed uh, professional counselor and she has gone through extensive training to deal with trauma. But prior to that, she would not be the best person to serve me or anybody else that's dealt with that because she is not specialized in it. It's such a specialty thing and there's so many nuances and facets of it relating to the brain and depression and anxiety and just all the physiological stuff that happens that it's going to mess you up worse if you get help from the wrong person than it is 
going to do any good. But even if you're at a position where you've tried it in the past, um, don't give up because this can be beaten. You can get over it. It doesn't define you. It's not who you are. It's what happened to you, but you can still have a thriving and successful life, whatever it may have looked like up to this point. So again, you guys aren't alone. Um, if I can be a resource in any way, that's my purpose in this video. I want to help people and I want to use my story for good. Um, so, you know, you can find all my contact information on my coaching page where I'm posting this. Um, feel free to give me a text, uh, email would be text or email would be preferable. I generally don't answer calls. I don't know. Uh, but you know, shoot me a text, shoot me an email. Let me know how I can help you or what I can do. And, um, I would love to be that resource for you guys. Okay. That's all I got. Thanks for listening. And I'll talk to you later.